My name is Julie Kaplan, and I'm the Manager of Public Programs at the Center for Jewish History. I'm happy to welcome you today to our virtual space to the second program in our new series called Family Affairs. The Center for Jewish History is a home for the archival collections of five partner institutions, the American Jewish Historical Society, the American Sephardi Federation, the Leo Beck Institute, the Evil Institute for Jewish Research, and the Yeshiva University Museum. Together, these collections create the largest archive of the Jewish experience outside Israel. The Family Affairs series features scholars who at different points in their careers decided to turn to their personal history and the micro and macro findings and questions these stories inspire. The series is curated by Dr. Natalia Alexian, who will be moderating all the conversations this academic year. We have three more already scheduled for the coming winter and spring. Before I pass through the virtual mic, let me introduce our speakers. Natalia Lection is Professor of Modern Jewish History at the Graduate School of Jewish Studies, Toro College, New York. Her research interests developed around the Holocaust, Polish and Jewish history and historiography, gender studies and beyond. She published Where To? The Zionist Movement in Poland, 1944 to 1950, and co-edited two volumes of Pauline, examining Holocaust memory and Jewish historiography. She has recently published a critical edition of the destruction of Zhukiev Jews by Gershon Tafet. Her book, Conscious History, Polish Jewish Historians Before the Holocaust, which we celebrated here in September, is about to be released by Littman Library of Jewish Civilization. She is preparing a volume of Pauline devoted to Jewish childhoods, children, and child rearing in Eastern Europe. She is currently a Gerda Henkel Fellow at Imre Kertes Kolleg in Jena, Germany, completing a book on Jewish medical students in East Central Europe. Dr. Devin Enar is the Isaac al Hadef Professor in Sephardic Studies, Associate Professor of History and Faculty at the Strom Center for Jewish Studies in the Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. A former Fulbright Scholar with a PhD in History from Stanford University, Dr. Nahr has transformed the University of Washington into a major center for the study of Sephardic history, culture, and language. His first book, Jewish Salonika, Between the Ottoman Empire and Modern Greece, won a 2016 National Jewish Book Award and the 2017 prize for best book awarded by the Modern Greek Studies Association. His current book project investigates the multifaceted experiences of Sephardi and Ashkenazi Jews with American conceptions of race. While he conducts research in six languages, Dr. Nahr speaks his endangered ancestral language, Ladino, with his two small children. Mary Jane Rochelson is Professor Emerita of English at Florida International University, where she is affiliated with the programs in Jewish Studies and Women's and Gender Studies. She earned her PhD in English from the University of Chicago and specializes in Victorian and late Victorian literature and culture, Anglo-Jewish literature and culture, Jewish immigration literature and history, and women's and gender studies. She is most recently the author of A Jew in the Public Arena, The Career of Israel Zangwill, the Broadview edition of Israel Zangwill's play, The Melting Pot, and Eli's story, A 20th Century Jewish Life, which she will focus on today. Before we start, I have two important reminders. First, you are welcome to write down your questions for the Q&A portion of our program. To do so, please use the Q&A function visible on the bottom of your screen. You can type your questions throughout the program. Please note that the chat function has been disabled. Second, the program is being recorded and will be available on the center's website and YouTube channel soon. We will email you the link to the recording as soon as it's available. And now I turn this over to Natalia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. And um, I'm grateful to the Center for Jewish History for creating this space for a conversation. And as Julie said, this is a continuation of a conversation we started with uh, Daniel Mendelssohn, Omar Bartov, and Antina Grossman um, almost two months ago in September thinking together about their projects uh, in which um, connection between uh, historians, uh, family history, 
and and research and and history that uh, one writes uh, led to fascinating uh, new uh, uh, new um, takes on on Jewish history, and we'll be continuing this conversation about blending this familial link and sources research and uh, intimate relationship with the subject matter with our guests today. So I want to get us started um, asking um, first the question about uh, intimacy. Both Jewish Salonika and Eli's story um, are dedicated to memory of grandfather in Devon's uh, case and a brother uh, for Mary Jane. And Mary Jane, in fact, um, inscribes herself into the chronology of the book in which she maps out um, um, her father's life, uh, but also her own birth. Uh, and so I wanted to ask uh, first Mary Jane and, and Devin how this intimate relationship with the subject matter, how it shaped your coming to write the book and your book. Thank you, Natalia. Actually, the book is dedicated not only to my brother who perished in the Holocaust, but to my children and my living brother's children and our grandchildren and all future generations, because those are all the generations of my father whom the book is about. So you asked about my intimate relationship to the material and how that works into a book that is also a scholarly book, as well as the story of my father's life. So it's it's kind of interesting, I think. Um, I, I originally thought about the book, and my brother, Bert Rochelson, was thinking about it too, really when we were quite young, because our father always told us he wanted a book written about his life. And in the early 1970s, um, my brother did an interview with him um, that I transcribed over several summers in the 2000s, and it appears in full as an appendix to the book. And we always felt that that interview would be the nucleus of our father's story. Um, I, I felt a kind of pressure to produce this book since I became a writer. And it's kind of a shame my brother isn't here to talk about his relationship to this story too, but I discuss it in the introduction. Um, it was sort of this general request of our family that at some point we write his story. And I followed the career of an academic and I knew that I wanted to be a writer and that I should write this story. And it was very, very, very difficult to do. And I only finally was ready, not simply after my father died in 1984, but after my mother died in 20, 2010, when there was just no living link. And my brother and I got together on this. We, we uh, I transcribed the interview that he had done, which was a very lengthy interview. And ultimate, and, and yet, as I did that, I saw that there were many gaps in the story because my father talked from his perspective with many historical events understood. Um, and also it was one account. And as a scholar who had already written a biography of a literary figure, Israel Sanguel, I knew that I needed to really develop this story for its full importance and value by doing additional scholarship. So I ended up making the um, interweaving parts of the interview with material that I discovered in the family archive, as we had talked about earlier, my father, saved lots and lots of stuff. I mean, he knew that there was going to be a book someday and he really, he saved a great deal, which I, I hope I'll have a chance to talk about later in more detail. 
but I had this documentation. The, um, the story, the interview started with his early life and his earliest memories, which involved his family moving from Kovna, now in Lithuania, then in the Russian Empire, to Southern Russia during World War I and being there during the revolution and the Russian Civil War, things that were not at the top of my mind, but that were really fascinating. And that of course I needed to do a little more research on to understand the context of what he was talking about. And it continues past through the Holocaust where I think, where I think I used the greatest where the greatest percentage of the narrative is in my father's own words, is in the Holocaust era. But for things that were missing, like the story of, of, of his wife's experience in Stutthof, I needed to look at and listen to other survivor testimonies on my, my, uh, my late brother's experiences at Auschwitz. I needed to look at other testimonies and interview some survivors. And then his work at, at the DP hospital at Landsberg am Lech, which he left quite a bit of material on, I also found a treasure trove in the YIVO archives, which had, um, which had blank hospital forms from the hospital that my father worked in and helped set up. It had announcements of sports events and chess games and holiday things and all, and things like that, that I had, I had nothing about until I went to Evo. And then um, finally for my father's arrival in America, I looked in the catalog of the Evo Institute and saw that they had a collection of Hayas, Heachem or Heatsem case files and through Gunnar Berg, an archivist at the YIVO Institute, I was able to get my father's entire case file and find out all sorts of things concerning his, uh, his transition from the DP camp to the United States, which was rather a complicated one. And of course, I read other published sources by scholars to make use of what they had already found. So it's a very, very personal book, extremely personal. And in fact, rereading it before uh, this event, I found myself becoming sad in a way that I was not when I wrote it because I was distanced from it and I was reading this story. But it is also something that I hope other scholars will find and make use of. Uh, there is so much that I hope we'll manage to squeeze into our 45 minutes no. that you had just touched on. And before, uh, uh, Devin, you, you tackled the same question. I must say yeah. that many years ago, um, I heard you speak, Devin, at the Center for Jewish History, and you actually mentioned your finding your family uh, in the archives. And I remember being mm -hmm. absolutely mesmerized by it because I came from um, academic uh, socialization in which there was quite a rigid divide between, you know, your personal and your and your professional uh, storytelling. Uh, and so I wanted, after all that time, to thank you about uh, for this moment of of really. Um, quite uh, um, quite openly um, showing your intimate engagement with your topic. But, but the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm really, I didn't know that. So, so, so thank you for sharing that, Natalia. Thank you. And um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here um, and to have the opportunity to participate in this conversation with, uh, with Mary Jane as well. And, um, I, I, you know, thinking about the question of intimacy as it relates to my research is a really obviously important aspect. And even the title of the program I find to be really powerful as well, not only to focus on the personal and the family, but also to have the two ideas, these two categories of Sephardi and Ashkenazi kind of side by side 
in a certain way is a, is a, a major transformation, I would say, in terms of how Jewish narratives are normally told, in which Jewish normally means, you know, European, it means Ashkenazi, it means white. Um, and so I think to have these two categories together like that um, is a real, uh, a real, it's an innovation in some ways. And I think it's, it's very important and it makes space for, for this kind of a conversation and for me to, to speak here in a way that when I began my research, you know, 20 years ago, that was not necessarily the case. And, you know, speaking of this idea of intimacy, I would say when I think about the intimacy of my work as it connects to my family, I mean, my family story, I mean, I, first of all, I should say that I have Sephardic and Ashkenazic roots that are woven together in my own sense of identity. And I think it's because of the absence of legibility or absence of recognition or absence of voices with regard to the Sephardic story, with regard to the city from which my grandfather came, the city of Salonika, Thessaloniki, in present day Greece. That was what really captivated me and um, made me want to uh, try to recover that world because it was a world that seemed to exist in its echoes, at least, like only in my family. And it didn't, there was not, you know, recognition is very, very important. It didn't, it was not in the history books. You know, when I went to college, I could not learn about Salonika in a Jewish history class. I could not learn about it in a course about the Holocaust. Um, I couldn't find anybody to help me understand the family documents that I came across because no scholar could read them for me. Um, so uh, I would say that together with the sense of intimacy, the stories and the powerful sense of connection to that world, the, the sounds of the languages, multiple languages, but especially Ladino, of the foods, um, of the stories, of my youth. I mean, these are very visceral kinds of connections that link me to that world. But then in the broader world, there was a, a great sense of invisibility. And so I guess to couple, uh, in my mind, I think about not only the issue of intimacy, but I also think about the concept of estrangement. Because, you know, I, growing up in, in America, as I did in New Jersey, you know, beyond the framework of my family environment or the Sephardic community of my father that we were still a little bit connected to, uh, I had to try to understand who I was in order to explain who I was to the outside world because people would ask. I mean, especially when I went to college or I became more interested in Jewish things, Nar, what kind of name is Nar? Oh, Narishkeit, are you a fool? Like, you know, I got like te I, I, I teased, I think, you know, in many, many different kinds of ways. And so in some ways, my early research became a kind of a reclamation and a statement of self-defense, you know, of trying to uh, explain who I was to the outside world and to explain how it can be that my grandfather spoke a language that is like Spanish that was written in Hebrew letters, but he was not born in Spain, but born in a part of the world that is now Greece, that used to be part of the Ottoman Empire. But I called him by the Italian word for grandfather, and he went to a French school, and I have a Hebrew surname that is not a Yiddish surname, and that, yes, my family was in Auschwitz as well. Like, all of those pieces are part of a unified whole that make complete sense in the context in which those cultural, political, and uh, I, I, concepts of identity were once operative and vibrant. But that was not our world. That, I, that was not the world I grew up in. So it's been a 20-year journey to try to bridge that divide. I mean, you can't, it's unbridgeable. You know, it's unbridgeable. But to try to uh, at least begin to make it legible, both to myself and to the to the outside world. And so in that regard, the intimacy of the project, I didn't have a choice. I mean, I, you know, I couldn't pretend like this is not about, you know, me or, or, or my family. Uh, that's what it's about. Um, I would love to follow up, but Mary, uh, Mary Jane was nodding vigorously um, uh, to what you were saying. So Mary Jane, do you want to jump in? 
I'm trying to remember the point at which I was nodding most vigorously. Do we very, very only moment? in my family was it understandable? Yes, yes, absolutely. Even though I come from the Ashkenazi context that is better known. And at this point, I want to say I love Devin's book and I have learned so much from it. And I have learned so much about Jewish history and the connections between the Ashkenazi and Sephardi history. So thank you. I think it is really important to bring these two together. But I had always thought, for example, I knew that my brother who was killed, he had gone when my when my father and his first wife, Serafima, were separated after being transported by cattle car out of the Kovna ghetto, Serafima went to Stutthof and the two of them decided that it would be best for their son, Borja, to stay with my father. But I never realized until I started looking into it that all of the women on that transport were sent to Stutthof. And all of the families that had sons decided that it would be better for the sons to stay with their fathers, who ended up at Dachau. And then these sons actually were in a group that became known as the 131 Boys of Kovna, who were, after a few weeks at Dachau, transported to Auschwitz. So. Here I was thinking this was an individual family thing. This was what my father's family did when in fact, no, it was something that many families went through. And so when you said that, I, you know, it just resonated with me because that's the kind of thing that comes from research even more than family stories, because family stories tend to emphasize individual experience. Mm -hmm. But I want to go back to family stories. And um, um, in what uh, Devin, you were saying, so much, I think, and again, connect these two, these two books. You, you talked about absence of voices, but, but then um, what you very beautifully describe uh, uh, in the introduction are the conversations with your grandfather, uh, those phone conversations with your grandfather. Um, uh, Mary Jane has um, tapes and, and in fact, the book is very much giving the voice to your father, right? This is not written in a, in a, um, in a historian's voice, um, uh, but rather giving him the the, the mic, as it were, um, and also uh, what what um, what Devin, what you mentioned, this question of uh, silence and estrangement, um, and a matter of translation. I think, in a way, for if I may, um, if I may uh, suggest it, that there is a degree of translating these uh, stories, not just from Latino, not just from. Uh, Yiddish and, and and Lithuanian. I mean, both families were multilingual in multilingual uh, context of of Jewish community in Kavna, Kaunas, in and in Saloniki. So, if you could talk a little bit more about this process of of translating and reconstructing as your as your research and writing went. And if, do you want to start, Devin? Sure, yeah. I mean, the the question of, of language and translation is obviously integral, I think, for both of our enterprises. And the first concept that comes to mind is actually loss for me, because, I mean, I grew up and, you know, in a monolingual home. And I think between my grandparents on both sides, there are probably like eight languages, you know, that they had some familiarity with, uh, it, you know, at, at, at some time. And so, you know, I've spent the last, you know, I've spent my whole career trying to re, <laughs> to, to, to re, uh, regather, to reclaim um, access to those languages so I could try to enter 
that world. And so um, there is a lot that is is lost over the course of the process of just trying to access the languages on the one hand. And then the other question of translation goes beyond just the languages itself, but also in terms of making the experiences contained in those languages or, or transmitted in those languages comprehensible to the uh, to a general kind of audience in an American context, at least in which the sort of the 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 mental map, the geography, the conceptual categories, uh, the uh, the identities are not really the ones that necessarily we're dealing with. You know, to think about how to explain the multiculturalism or the the multi ethnicity of the Ottoman Empire. You know, of a, of a Muslim world in which there was room for Jews, in which you know. Uh, to think about Jews and Muslims in a kind of a shared space rather than an adversarial kind of environment, or to think of Jews as speaking a Spanish language. You know, there are many accounts when Jews come to New York and in the early 20th century from places like Salonika and everybody thinks that they're Puerto Rican, you know, because there's no other reference point for, for, for Spanish in, in an American context. And how could you be Jewish if you speak Spanish and you've never seen a matzo ball in your life and you, you gesticulate or you look like an Italian or something like this is the kind of rhetoric that you can find from that period. So it required a lot of effort, I think, to try. And this is, this is a typical process. I mean, for many, for many, many projects that involve this, uh, trying to bring a world that is different in some ways, both in geography, and in chronology from our current, you know, sort of universe. Um, encouraging Mary Jane to take oh, on. This. Okay, okay. So again, a great deal to identify with. You were um, you were raised in a unilingual home, which is amazing to me, given the breadth of your language knowledge. Now, I was raised in a bilingual home, Yiddish and English, but mainly because my mother's mother lived with us until she died when I was 12 years old. Uh, I also come from a mixed family. My mother's parents were immigrants during the great wave of immigration. They came in 1906 and 1910. So, and my father, of course, was a Holocaust survivor who came in 1946. And because my grandmother who lived with us spoke only Yiddish, though she understood English, Everyone who came to visit spoke Yiddish with her. She spoke Yiddish with her grandchildren and we responded in English. Only now am I really studying Yiddish and learning how to read it and, and to speak it and so on. Um, I relied on translators, wonderful translators, in looking at the primary sources for my book. And, um, but there was this idea in America when I was growing up and apparently when you were too, that the children needed to learn English. Let's not foist these old languages on them. Now, my dad was fluent in many languages, especially Russian, which was the language he used in his family home with his first wife and his child. He went to Russian schools. He did not go to the Hebrew gymnasium in Kovna. He went to the Russian gymnasium. I could have been fluent in Russian. <laughs> if only my parents had decided that he would speak to me only in Russian. But they didn't. In those years, people didn't do that. And I studied Russian in college, and I became fairly good at reading and writing and speaking, but most of that ability I no longer have. I just I just know a small amount. And of course, I can still read Cyrillic letters, which leads people to think I'm some kind of genius when I can do that. But, but yeah, I kind of, I, I really regret that that was the ethos at, at the time. Um, I am trying to make up for it now, though, with, with becoming more proficient in Yiddish, although I always had a good understanding of it. Yeah, so I want to uh, go back for a moment uh, to um, the materiality that, I, in a way, both of you mentioned. And if mm -hmm. you could share um, one find, either in a family drawer or in the archives, this yeah. moment, this, this material document in your, 
in your search uh, to translate that world and to, to reconstruct it that made that difference for you. Also as a historian of a, of a family, uh, of a family affair as it were, and a community. And we'll come back to that tension in a moment. Uh, uh, Mary Jane? Sure, I'm going to get it. I am in my study and it's right here. Okay. Right, this, this file, this file folder, when my mother um, was, was clearing out her apartment to move, um, I was going through her dresser drawers and in the bottom drawer, there were three or four identical files of this. This is the original. And this is not so much about the family, but this is a document that was phenomenal. This, this is a file of the documents that my father put together to reestablish his medical credentials in the United States. He had gotten his MD degree from the University of Vitautis the Great in Kaunas in June 1940, right when the Soviets invaded Lithuania. And as he writes at the beginning of this summary of documents, while in the concentration camp at Dachau, Germany, see item five below, all original documents, including the diploma of doctor of medicine were taken away by the Germans and destroyed. And in order, and, and first of all, that in itself is a phenomenal statement to see just typewritten on a piece of paper. Um, but because he didn't have his diploma, he had to get all these other things, um, including certificates of the courses he took, signed by fellow students and professors who were now in the United States, who he, who he looked up. Um, photocopied pages from the journal of the Lithuanian Medical School that he went to indicating that he was in the graduating class. And you see the little 1946 version of a post-it here pointing to his name. Um, he, documents that showed that he worked in the hospital in Lonsberg and that he was a doctor. Uh, this was phenomenal to me. I mean, this brought it all home. And then in the folder, he also put some later correspondence, including a letter from the AMA, the American Medical Association, telling him that they would be very happy to admit him, but they need to have a certified copy of his diploma since he graduated from a foreign medical school. And of course he had written to them originally that he didn't have his diploma because it was taken from him at Dachau. And you just see the kinds of frustration that he went through, but you also see his, uh, his persistence and the way he saved every single thing um, including uh, something, a, a note from his English tutor. So he was a, he called himself stubborn and he was in the best way. He was very persistent. So this, this is really the most telling thing that I found and I found it, you know, years after he had died. It also means actually that he traveled with his medical diplomas to Dachau. Yes, yes, I, yes, I was going to say that, that he, ha he had his medical diploma in all the time that he was in the Kovna ghetto. He had it in the cattle car that transported him to Dachau. He had his medical diploma with him. It was, it was, one of his very greatest valuables and possibly the greatest valuable. Devin, who what, what said he was find? a doctor, so yeah. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank, thank you. I think it, I, I think maybe it might be true for, for Mary Jane as well, but for me, the question of materiality is, is actually connected closely with the question of intimacy. 
I mean, you have that file right there on your on your shelf. You're you're holding it. I mean, and so you know, I, I sort of think about these connections as being interconnected. Um, you, know, when I first became interested in learning more about uh, my family experience, uh, especially as it related to the Holocaust, so my grandfather and his family had come to the United States when my grandfather. Uh, my nono was a, was a boy, and his oldest brother, who had been in the states, went back to um, went back to Greece, and uh, they had he and his family disappeared in the war. And I I wanted to learn more about what that what the, what did we know about their experience? And I'd heard stories that my uh, great uncle Salomon and his wife Esther they had two kids, Benny and Rachel, and I had heard my aunt Connie once told me that. You know that they played uh one of them was taking violin violin and the other one was playing the piano but they didn't say anything about what happened during the war itself and i remember i asked another one of my uh great uncles uh uncle leon i said you know do you have any documents any any information about uncle solomon and he said he they were res didn't really want to get into it initially um it was a kind of a dark chapter um, but eventually he went into his closet and he pulled down a box and opened it up and there were some a, a small stack of books and some uh, a few letters and the books were the remnants of my great grandfather's library he was a rabbi in uh, in Salonika in Ottoman Salonika subsequently Greek Salonika Greek Thessaloniki and then in Harlem in New York when they came in the 20s and then eventually in New Jersey where he was the first you know, formal rabbi of the Sephardic congregation at that's a Chaim, which is now in Highland Park, in uh, in New Jersey. And I remember looking at these letters and these and these books, and I was like, "What? What is going on here?" Because, I mean, I I couldn't make heads or tails out of them. Um, and my great uncle says, "Well, that's all. It's all you know. It's all in Spanish." And I said, "What are you talking about? This is not you know." Latin letters. He says, well, that's how we used to write Spanish. And I said, you know, can you read it? And I said, well, no, I don't, I don't remember how to read any of that anymore. And so that sort of led me on a kind of uh, a, a journey to try to decipher these texts, both the printed stuff, which were Ladino books in Rashi script, and also these family letters. But I remember the first feeling that I had was one of connection because here it was. I didn't know my great grandfather, who was the rabbi. I didn't know my great uncle or his family, who died in Auschwitz. But there I am holding these documents that came from them. You know, they have a smell. There's a corporeality to them. There is a sense of 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 trans, you know, transversing, of crossing across the generations, of of the geography of that world. You know, beginning to you can start to see the. Again, that, that, that estrangement, the, the gap, you can get closer to that sense of intimacy right there. And that sort of launched me into trying to decipher these documents and to try to find out more. And if I could just add one other small piece, which is that, you know, I wound up eventually um, deciphering these, uh, these documents, these family letters, and one of them described how, written by a friend after the war, described how my great uncle had been put on the committee of the Matanot Levonim in Salonika, the Jewish soup kitchen. And he was responsible for distributing milk and yogurt to the sick and elderly as they um, boarded the trains to Auschwitz in Salonika in, in the spring of 1943. That explains why he and his family were among the very last to remain in the city. And when I first went to Salonika and I was looking for records of the community, I was told that there was nothing left, nothing is left, it was all destroyed, the Germans took it, then there's a whole big story, then the, the Soviets wound up re-stealing the stolen archives and a bunch of that stuff wound up in Moscow. But some of the stuff wound up in Salonika and I was able to find some of it in an old Jewish community building in a closet. And going through these materials, it was like somebody took the records of the Jewish schools and the community council and the soup kitchen, and they threw it up and it was all in disarray. And I'm going through these documents and I come through some information about the Matanot Levionim. And I'm looking through them and there I find a letter from my great uncle in which there's a copy of the outgoing letter. It's in Greek, by the way. 
and it invites him to serve on the committee of the Matanot Levionim. And there is his response in very perfect Greek, very nice Greek penmanship, that it would be his, you know, honor and duty to serve on this on this committee. And there it was. Like again, tr these documents, the physicality of these pieces of paper, helping me to bring to life, not only for myself, but I hope also for my readers, this uh, this lost world. This is this is exactly a wonderful segue to the, my next um, question. That again, uh, we we should really have a night for for it. Uh, let's treat it just as an aperitif, um, which is that tension between family history and and Jewish history. And you both uh, uh, play with that tension differently. Um, uh, and I was thinking about it that. Um, Mary Jane, you, you titled your book um, A 20th Century Jewish Life, right? And and for Devin, this is your your um, great uncle serves as a as a as an entrance into what you called the lost uh, world of Sadonica Jewry. So if you could if you could talk to that tension of um, you know, one life or really one family, uh, since you talk about your your father's entire familial milieu, uh, and then the opposite, I guess, the opposite relationship uh, in, in Devin's book. Um, Mary Jane, do you want to start? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I very consciously gave the book that subtitle because it is Eli's story, but I really want readers to see it as while unique and individual, also in some sense, paradigmatic of Jewish history, at least in one part of the world, or maybe actually a few parts of the world since we go through Lithuania, Russia, Germany, and the United States throughout the 20th century. And my father's personal history brought him into so many historical narratives. I mean, one of his earliest memories is playing with his friends by the river and learning that war had broken out. He was seven years old and it was World War I. And then traveling to Southern Russia where they lived in Rostov-on-Don and, and, and then traveling back and, um, of course, the Holocaust, and of course, the post-Holocaust era. So it's it's an individual life, but it's a life that at every point was shared by many others. Um, one of the things I've been trying to find, and you can't find it on Jewish Gen yet because they don't have um, they don't they don't have full Russian. Uh, materials that were in Soviet Russia, but I would love to find information about my maternal great grandmother's grave because she died while the family was in Rostov or on their way to Rostov, and they would be in these, um, I guess formerly Soviet archives, although it all took place at the time of the revolution, but you can't find those the way you can find archives for the Baltic states. And if you know differently, please tell me, because I really would like to find something, some more archival evidence from that period. Um, but of course, you know, my father talked about the Russian school he went to. Well, I found a scholarly article about that specific Russian school and the man who had founded it. So I'm not sure I would necessarily call it tension as in friction, but it was certainly a tension at each point in what I would include and what I would not include because there were always things that I felt were really important for, well, I, eventually the things that I included, I felt were important both for the individual history and for Jewish history. That was, that was ultimately what happened as the result of many decisions, yeah. 
I feel like from from my perspective, I, I, th I think about it with an additional layer, which is I was trying to situate my family experience within a broader history that had not yet been written. And so I felt like I had to do both of those tasks simultaneously. In other words, when I began my research, there wasn't really like a bibliography. I mean, there were some, there was a little bit of scholarship, but it was somewhere as I was into my research that the first book in English about the city of Salonika had, you know, came out. Uh, and there's since been some other stuff, or even about Sephardic Jews in the Ottoman Empire. There wasn't really uh, much scholarship there against which I could very readily situate my work in the beginning. And so I constantly had this kind of dialogue between my family history, the broader narrative of the community and the world of the Ottoman Empire and the Jews of the Ottoman Empire that I was trying to uh, articulate, and then to place that in dialogue with the narratives that were out there about Jewish history more generally, general about European history, um, about the Middle East. And so there was, there were like, there were these multi layers or kind of nested tensions, I guess, if you would, you know, in terms of thinking about the individual, my individual family story, that broader city in the world, and then how does it fit into the narrative of Jewish history in which that big, bigger story was not really yet a part. Um, and I think one of the challenges that I also faced in this process was thinking about representability, like how representative is my, you know, family story, especially, I think it, it may be a little bit different if there are many voices to begin with, and you can sort of create a mosaic or a collage and get some depth to the uh, experiences to make them human, because you see there are many different ways of experiencing it. But one of the challenges that I faced in, in my work is is trying to, you know, well, if this is the only thing that people are going to encounter, maybe, you know, what is the, what are the stakes that are involved? What is the burden in some ways that's placed on the work to try to speak um, for really many, many different kinds of experiences? And I think in some ways um, that, you know, I, I don't know if I've resolved that question just yet, but I think that in some ways my family story is emblematic of certain paths that were available to, to families um, at that time. The path of migration was certainly one that was available, and in that regard my family fits some of the broader, you know, trajectories. They, even though my great-grandfather was a rabbi, they were from a poor family. They lived in a, in a poor neighborhood that is still a poor neighborhood today, 100 years later in Salonika, even though there are no Jews there anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, the, I think the one unusual feature about my family's story as it relates to the broader picture is about my great uncle who I talk about, who went to the States, he came back, and unlike many Jews who fortune, whose fortunes seem to um, go down, in fact, as the years went on, uh, he was able to ascend. He moved from the living in the, the periphery of the city in this poor neighborhood to living in the center of the city, to being a middle class person. And so in that regard, my family has multiple elements of the class dimension, of the professional dimension, and uh, begins to speak to some of the many, many different paths that were available um, to people in that community and in the broader world that they are serving as, in some ways, representatives of. This is this is fascinating. And, and I must say that when I was rereading your book, uh, apropos the, the, the Ashkenazic Sephardic uh, stories really merging and not only merging in, in Auschwitz, uh, mm -hmm tragically. Uh, but I was thinking about, uh, again, uh, Daniel Mendelssohn's uh, great, uh, great uncle, who also is in the US, comes back, uh, is prosperous. And then there are those letters in which he's um, asking his family for help with immigration. And, and you mentioned in your book, uh, also futile attempts in uh, in leaving uh, in the late 30s. So it's, it's, uh, it's really, um, quite striking and and i think that what what both of you and that's another a connection what both of you really do wonderfully in a different way 
is that variety of choices, as, as, uh, as Devin, you put it, but also variety of identities, also linguistic identities between you know, Russian speaking home, Yiddish speaking home, studying medicine in Lithuania in a national university in a newly reestablished or established uh, uh, state. Uh, and, and, and your, uh, your Devon, your story, um, a beautifully and complexly told story of Ottoman Greek uh, a transformation with many paths to the side. I, we don't have time, but I do want to ask one more question about Lacrimal's um, uh, Jewish history. You, uh, Mary Jane mentions that this is not just a story of suffering and survival. Um, and I was wondering, what is it then? And, and Devin, in that context, is this why you didn't include a chapter on the Holocaust, not to have it overshadow, um, you know, an account of community, rabbinate, school, uh, and education? How did that um, affect the, the making of the book? And then we'll, we'll have a moment for questions from the audience. Should I go? I, okay. Um, so it was an, a deliberate decision on my part to not focus on the Holocaust in the book. It lingers over the entire thing. Um, you know, it lingers over the entire, my entire research um, in some ways. And that was enough. In fact, I mean, that's, that, that was sort of enough um, for me. And also because I wanted to push back against many of the narratives that we have received popular and historiographically that have the teleology that you know that jewish history to, to cut back against some of the teleologies that we have that that jewish history ends at auschwitz or it ends in israel or it ends in the promised land of america or some other kind of mythology like that and i wanted to kind of bracket those and by bracketing them actually to try to undermine them <laughs> in, in in some ways and to show the way like you know Looking back, we could see how it got to where it got, but I wanted to try to historicize my narrative and to try to um, present and share the viewpoints that the historical actors, that the people that I was looking at, um, what, what were their visions of the future in the past? Where did they think that they could go? What kinds of decisions that they were making? And I tried in a way to uh, not only to restore their voices through, you know, documents in their own languages, but to try to restore their limited but nonetheless existent sense of agency that they were historical actors making decisions facing uh, even before the war, you know, in many instances, very s s serious forms of discrimination or disenfranchisement or other forms of uh, challenges like that, but to try to understand a world that is not focused on death, but a world that is focused on life. Because I think that that's really, as much as the story of the Holocaust is essential, and I don't want to minimize that by any, any means, I wanted to open up a space for talking about life, because I think that's where you get a sense of really what was lost. And if you don't understand what was lost, and if we speak only from 1939, you know, onwards, we actually don't understand just how devastating the Holocaust was, just how destructive it was. So I wanted to give some time and some space for the stories of the institutions of the community, of the literary and the historical, you know, the writers and the journalists and the rabbi, to try to let them have a, a, a moment for them to be able to have their stories told. Yes, and yes, Devin, exactly. And that is why the subtitle is A 20th Century Jewish Life. And you now have helped me enunciate it more clearly because my father's life did kind of pivot on the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. It happened right at the middle of his life. He was in his thirties and he died at the age of 76. But that means that half of his life was before then and half of it was after. And I, I devote a fair amount of space in the book 
to explaining what his extended family's life was like, how they would go out to a park that I visited when I went to Lithuania in 2003 and pick wildflowers. All the kids would play games and pick wildflowers. And there are still wildflowers in that park. His, I have a picture of one of his brothers and his fellow members of the Coach Sports Club. I have a picture of his sister who married a non-Jewish German visiting Montevideo, Uruguay in the late 1920s because her husband had family there. And then after she died in 1934, her non-Jewish husband went to Kovna to visit the family and they all sent a postcard back to my uncle Dave, who was already living in the United States. These were people who were moving forward in their lives, who had lives that were so much like ours. I even include my father's telephone number in Kovna, which he mentioned in a different interview that he had done for the New York Public Library. These were people like us. And yes, the Holocaust was this disaster that came in the middle, and that was hard to move past. And of course, my father never totally moved past it, as no Holocaust survivor did, but he did recreate his life and lots of things happened then. And I talked about those and I talked about how we went to see the Moiseev dancers and the three sisters, you know, where my father listened to the Russian and the rest of us had to wear headphones. But yes, exactly, exactly. And as you say, the history of Jewish Salonika had not yet been told. So it was your job to tell it. And yeah, right. Thank you. Okay, I have a couple of questions from our audience. <clears throat> the first one I can answer myself. Somebody asked if this program is being recorded. Uh, yes, it is. And we're going to email the link to everybody who signed up as soon as it's available. Um, okay, here's a good question. Thanks so much for this interesting and essential conversation. Can you both discuss whether or not you think there is a relationship between one's experiences of personal slash familial and or historical trauma and the ability to have empathy for the marginalized or traumatized others in your society? Mm. I can answer that. I, I, my father had enormous empathy for the marginalized. Um, he ended up practicing medicine in um, in an area, if anyone knows New York, probably a lot of people there know New York, that was sort of on the cusp of Williamsburg and Bedford Stuyvesant. And his patients were mostly African American and Puerto Rican. And at one point, he designed a plan for a community center there, which never came to fruition. But he really wanted to see that community develop. And he told me once very proudly, this was, I had, I think I had just recently graduated from college, that he signed a medical form for one of his patients who was, um, who was entering Barnard College, the college I had graduated from. And he was so proud of her. And he said, oh, he knew the whole family. And recently, well, you know, a year or so ago, I received a message from a woman, it was on Facebook messages, that her cousin, who, who I figured out later had seen my announcement of my book in the Barnard Alumni Magazine, told her that a book had been written about my father. And this woman who is, I believe a Hispanic woman, wrote to me how my father was just such a wonderful man and how she remembered him so well. And I mean, she had been his patient in the 1960s. And I grew up with the sense that you don't, uh, you know, that you don't look at people's wealth. You don't look at people's rank. You look at people's goodness. You know, it, and this was this was something that I saw in my father all the time. And 
It certainly was an influence on me. Um, maybe I could add, I, I think that in terms of the question of empathy, I think it's certainly a, a, a possible in the way that you describe uh, Mary Jane in terms of uh, conceptualizing one's experience and bringing that to bear in relation to the think about others' experiences. But I, I think it can go other ways as well. I mean, yeah. I think, you know, in, 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 the, in the introduction, you, know, you referred to uh, Spiegelman's mouse uh, right. in, in your book. Right. And, uh, right. and, and one of the scenes yeah. in Mouse that really strikes me is, I, I don't remember in which volume it is or where exactly it takes place, but Art is with his father and that they're at uh, a stoplight. And, you know, he's an Auschwitz survivor, the father. Right. And they're at a stop a stoplight, and there's a, a black guy on a black man on the corner, and Art Spiegelman's father uses a Yiddish, a derogatory Yiddish term to describe him as a black person. He says, "Quick, step on the gas," you know. In other words, so the yeah. fact of this experience of trauma did not miraculously right. open him up to the injustices of the world and open his heart and make him empathize and want to be a protector or want to come to the aid of addressing uh, questions of injustice or intolerance or anything like that. And I think oftentimes we see that, the, I think that Art Spiegelman's father is, the, that's for better or worse, I feel like that's oftentimes the way that the story uh, goes. I mean, think about the the experience of immigration in this country, the trauma of people who came in the last hundred years, you know, wanting to pull up the, you know, now it's let's build the wall. We got in. Quick, we got in. Build the wall so nobody else can get in. I mean, um, I feel like that is actually uh, redoubling in some ways the yeah. experiences of, of, of trauma. But I think at the same time, uh, like for me, at least, I think as, as you alluded to, Mary Jane, for you as well, like my family's experience, how I think about it deeply informs my worldview and how I think about other people. It deeply informs my politics. Um, sure. So, I, you know, I, I think that there are, again, multiple kinds of paths that can emerge from experiences of trauma. They can be internalized and compounded and they can also be, um, you know, they can be used in other kinds of uh, other kinds of transformative ways. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would like to add, though, that, I mean, the majority of Jews in America, at least according to how Jewish people oh. voted, were not build the wall types. No, no, no. So some of them were. Some of them were. Uh, but one thing that I found very moving was that during the Gaza War, it was apparently Holocaust survivors in Israel who were very distressed by the suffering of the people of Gaza. So I'm glad you brought up the other side of it, because, yes, absolutely. And I was about to say I'm always shocked when I see Holocaust survivors who have those kinds of build the wall attitudes. But I think I think there are there are both. Yeah. No, you're and absolutely with my dad. Right. It was it was it was very different. And maybe it was just his character and the way he was brought up and the fact that he was helped by others too when he went through very difficult experiences. So he, he appreciated that. But I think it's interesting uh, in what Devin also, what you were saying that there are two uh, sides to this question. One is the, the side of asking, I think about the, the actors who go through it, but also you as scholars vis-a-vis mm -hmm. Right. Your, your topic and your work. And it's very clear how much your own work and, and uh, desire to bring voices and to uh, give uh, us voices a chance to, to be heard, how much this, is sh this has shaped your work. Uh, Julie, do we have time for one more question? Um, okay, let's do one more question, um, which originally was just directed to Devin, but then the questioner asked if they can both comment. So it says, can you talk about how you dealt with um, gaps in family story that you couldn't just fill in with research or historical mm -hmm. or macro information? Mm -hmm. In other words, the limitations in this work. Mm -hmm. Devin? I made it up. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think, you know, it's a very, it's a really important question because 
in some ways, what there are are mostly gaps, I would say, in my experience, is I have mostly gaps. And um, what I try to do is oftentimes, like in my family stories or in my other, in my, in my current research, I'm trying to put together some stories of other families and their, you know, and move and their movements and, and their experiences. And um, what I try to do is sometimes when there are gaps, I can draw on analogy or inference you know, imagining that someone in a particular, in a similar kind of circumstances, you know, may have had this experience. And I know that the person that I'm looking at, or, you know, my family um, was in a similar kind of circumstance. Perhaps they mm -hmm. would have done X, um, you know, X, Y, or, or Z um, that, you know, that that becomes something that I'm, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out. Like, so for example, one of the things I'm trying to, to look at right now is one of my uh, relatives in New Jersey, uh, they were Sephardic and they got married at the Yiddish Workmen Circle in mm. New Brunswick. Mm. Okay. So what I hope to find out is um, like, were they like involved in Yiddish socialism as Ladino speaking Ottoman born Jews? Seems unlikely. But, you know, possibly, or was the Yiddish Workman Circle like a more of a kind of a community center that you could use for other kinds of purposes? So once, so what I, so that's like a kind of a hole that I, I can't really explain right now, but I hope to, by understanding the broader context, what some other people in their environment did, what that space could have been used for to suggest, like I won't, I don't know if I can know unless I find something that said they were a member of this organization or that, you know, here's they were just, you know, happened to use the space. But what I'm trying to do now is to just understand the broader context and make some informed um, inferences, I guess you could say. And I'll just answer briefly. Um, there are places in my father's narrative where I wish I could have asked a follow up question. <laughs> and, you know. And I kind of speculate, well, maybe they did this or maybe they did that. But in the end, I just don't know. And the phrase, I don't know, appears very often in, in the book because I don't know. And I think that's something that's significant about trying to recreate history. You can't tie everything together neatly. And in fact, the epilogue of my book, which is really like a chapter, is about a, a search that I did that did not end in any certainty. Um, the answer, I, I was simply unable to find any answer. And I don't know if I ever will, probably not. But yeah, I think, I think you have to be honest when writing any kind of history and, uh, you know, make it clear when you still don't know the answer. That's something somebody else might do in their book. I would echo that. I think that's the the absolute right approach to recognize our our limits and what we right. don't know. What we don't in know. A strange, we in a strange way, I think that Davin, your epilogue is also in a way about mm, yeah, you know, the right. silence and and what comes from and in between silence. Uh, and I think we are already at the end of our time, Julie. Right? Yes, we are. Um, before we go, I'd like to thank our director of academic programs, Dr. Malgajata. Bacalarge du Verger, who helped to organize this program. And thank you for our wonderful speakers and for our audience. Thank you thank all. You. Come back yeah. in February. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.